Very nice. He's giving and he's receiving. There's a there's a the concept in um, in in kabbalistic things about can can Hashem receive anything, mm -hmm. or is it really that He's giving us to do these things and it's really for us, and He's completely in of Himself. Rav Cook goes as far to say in one of his books <coughs> called Orot Orot Kodesh, he has a chapter called Shlemut Vihishdalmut. Perfection <laughs> and the and 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 hishtalmut becomes means becoming more perfect. Can God, who is shalem, who is the, he is the absolute maximum of perfection, become more perfect? <coughs> so he, he he says, if you say it, if you're careful, of course. We say sometimes kiviachol. If it were, as it were, if it can be said, if we could say such a thing, yes, so to speak. Or so to speak, that that by her, by virtue of having brought forth creation from potential to actuality, and have a relationship with with us, we were in the Ain Sof. But now that He's created us as such, and He interacts with us, and He's bringing us to perfection, then He becomes more perfect in the process. Kiviachol. And it can't other it can't be other than that because who are we to say? What do we know? So these are a little deep, but the idea that God receives from us, we say, is more like the parent. The idea that Hashem has nachat ruach, He has pleasure when His children align themselves with His will and become capable of channeling and becoming embodiments of that will. And that's the the privilege that we have, and the and the and the nacha, right? The the pleasure, the 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 pleasure that we give the the holy one. It's an anthropomorphism, but it's 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 beautiful. What can what can be more you know fitting for a real relationship? So I guess so. So Hashem receives from us. So let it be our prayer too. Please, Hashem, we see what we're doing here. We're sitting here. We're trying to make a sacred circle of consciousness of your presence. May that be what you... To make a, a reshut a yachid, a, a place for the one. <coughs> in each one of us, in our individual lives, and in all of us together, in all of Amisrael, and the entire the entirety of mankind. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Wishful thinking. But that's what it's about. The time is right. Makich <clears throat> Ramaya. You throw down that which is high. Empires fall. Presidents fall. Prime ministers fall. Other things become raised up maybe more subtly at first, something is, being, is rising up. Some desire in mankind is rising up. It's for us to, 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 get, to empower that desire. And by finding it in ourselves and empowering all others who have it, whatever country, whatever nationality, we are, a, we are an international people, right? We are an international people. It's not by chance that we've been on almost every continent in the world, right? Because we know every civilization from the inside. Why does Hashem do that? The infiltrators we are, right? As Rabbi Kaplan's book, the, If You Were God, we're the infiltrators. We're the ones who are sent down here to change the people on the island and to bring them to a higher level of development. We are sparks. We lift up sparks in, in our relationships, our interactions, and everything. And we are sparks ourselves. Everything is sparks of holy, and everything is energy frequencies of the Great One. Have moments of oneness in our life when we realize, and I think that's what Torah is about, is to give us that, that sense really is one. It really is connected. It really is happening. I saw... 24 part PBS special called The Elegant Universe based on Brian Greene's book 
by that name. At one point, he tried to explain why the 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 paradox of the, the gravity. There's four four things that hold the nucleus together. Yeah. The strong force. They're very like creative names. The strong force, the weak force, the gravitational force, and the electromagnetic force. And I have a friend who felt that uh, the that the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies is the unifying force. It's the it's the uh, the unifying force, and that the the table, <coughs> the menorah, and the table, and the incense altar, and the outer altar are four forces, and that the unifying force of all of them is the Ark of the Covenant. Very powerful idea. Anyway, so Brian Greene is trying to explain the paradox of gravitation why in the, in the macro world of objects it has a very powerful pull more than the others. But on the subatomic level, the gravitational um, pull minimizes to almost infinitesimal, um, almost disappears. Whether that's true, whether everybody would agree, there's all kinds of talk in physics and super strings, etc., about gravitation and where it is at those, at those deep levels. But just based on what he said, when I, when I heard that, I did a spiritual take on it. Is that in the external world, the, the world of objects, of macro objects, paro, the great, the great illusion, um, the king of illusion, the one who makes you think that you're that you're his subject, the one who imprisons you and subjugates you to his laws and to his to building his kingdom. So on the subatomic level, Paro has no power. <clears throat> Out here, Amuna and Tfila and Torah and Kedusha have no meaning in Paro's world. Amuna, faith, prayer, that prayer works, that God is here. All those things can be made fun of in the world of the newspapers and the magazines, right? But on the inner levels, all that falls away. And the real thing is Imuna and Tfila and Torah and, and Shrina, the real things of life. Anybody make, can, anybody, can anybody use that? Can anybody relate to that? On the inside level, then you really know that these are the real, the real basics of life. And what we have to do then is to bring them out <coughs> into our, yeah. Um, my question at the moment is that we scientifically know that prayer works. So, so all the work that Dr. Emoto did with prayer and water and photographing the crystals forming based on words and, you know, all that. And works. even in universities there's prayer groups. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. there's it's scientifically nobody's told that, that prayer makes a difference. Right. We scientifically know that it's now fact. However, we especially as Jews also, we know that, that's scientifically real, proven, measurable, blah, blah. And then we also live with, I'll just take the biggest extreme, we live with the Holocaust where people were praying, the and highest people, and, and nothing happened. So... We have both evidences that prayer forms crystals that are photographable, blah, blah. And then we have the opposite where nothing happens. So I, I just would like you to address that. Or, or it might seem that nothing happens. Well, those crystals didn't. Those well, crystals shattered. <laughs> yes. I think you have to separate the difference between prayer having a direct effect on another person as compared to having an effect on Hashem, have a Hashem degree. In other words, sometimes the prayer may appear to affect the person's you know, biochemistry, he does stuff along with, etc. But even if it doesn't, Hashem decides what's going to be, and then they show up in, in the, in the, uh, the bodily organism. Also, another thing is you got to be aware of is that they, I read recently somewhere that when someone does an act of charity and kindness, it releases certain chemicals in the body that strengthen the body's defenses. But there's a concept, I think, in the Talmud that talks about a charity that uh, saves you from death. And it gives a situation where I think someone's cutting into a bread and uh, he's going to share it with somebody and, uh, and he cut the snake in half. And if, uh, if he didn't do that, he might have been killed by the snake. So th there again, there's a difference between things happening in the physical world, you know, as 
appears to what Hashem may or may not decree. Thank you. <coughs> so, 